Hi, y'all. Let's chat a little bit about uh, Dr. Christine Blase Ford and uh, Brett Kavanaugh and the hearing that they had. So I've um, watched the news and I watched the hearings and I've read articles and listened to people talk and um, it, there seems to be um, some things that people failed to notice that happened at the hearing uh, or to the extent that they were noticed, they were trivialized by the people who observed them. Uh, they talked about the performance of that prosecutor and how she seemed, you know, it was boring. It wasn't, she wasn't putting on a good show and how uh, she was um, asking these questions, but she only managed to really talk about peripheral, unimportant issues and things of that nature. That's not true. She actually did a really, really good job, and it's precisely what you want uh, from anyone who is a criminal investigator, prosecutors, you know, help investigate crimes and whatnot. And um, it's about assessing the ability of the person who is presenting some testimony, some affiant, some declarant, whatever it happens to be, uh, how accurate are they with respect to what they claim to know? And Dr. Ford uh, is unable, it seems, to distinguish between what is a fact, something that she remembers having happened, uh, and what is an assumption about what happened. Now, this is not uncommon. People do this all the time, even law enforcement officers. And a person will uh, very easily make an assumption. They will assume that something is a fact that they don't know to be a fact, and they will believe it that that they will believe that it is a fact, and they will represent it as a fact. So they're not being dishonest. It's just you know part and parcel of being a person. Uh, you have made an assumption which you believe to be true. So when you represent that false statement, uh, you're doing so in good faith. You are honestly wrong. You're not being deceptive. It's there's no chicanery there. You have just made a mistake. Now, one of the difficulties in criminal prosecutions and the defenses of them is that lawyers like to play a game. If you are incorrect, it's not simply that you've made a mistake, it's because you have lied. And if uh, someone disagrees with you, if someone uh, says something that contradicts what you've said, uh, the, the prosecutor, the defense counsel, whoever it is, uh, they're not going to ask you, oh, so they're mistaken. They're going to ask you, oh, so they, you're saying they lied because they want uh, to paint you in a particular light in front of the jury. And, you know, your counsel should definitely prepare you for that because it is a very disingenuous but common tactic. Um, anyway, <clears throat> by the way, remember, uh, prosecutors and defense counsel aren't under any kind of uh, oath not to ask disingenuous questions. All they can, their only ethical restraint is they can't lie, they can't suborn perjury. But a question that's properly phrased, by which I mean to say it does not assume its conclusion, it's, you know, a proper question, isn't a lie. Uh, and it's up to you as the witness to recognize when you're being fed one of these questions, the answer to which is designed to make you say something that isn't the case, uh, because they want to rattle you. Anyway, uh, the same happens with the senators in the hearings. Uh, remember that when they do these hearings, they're not under oath at all. The only time they're under oath is when they're sitting as a court uh, to conduct a trial during an impeachment. All other times, they're, in fact, they have a constitutional immunity for anything that they say. They can make up whatever they want, and you can't sue them. They can Anyway, whatever. So, um, for one of the difficulties here, obviously, is that she's talking about an event that, if it did happen, happened 35, you know, 36 years ago. And uh, you know, that's a long time to wait to come forward with a, with a claim. A lot of time for people to make mistakes, to forget things, to remember things that didn't happen, which actually happens far more frequently than you think, and to uh, bake into your recollection of, of an event to the extent that it happened, a whole bunch of things that didn't happen, assumptions that you've made about things that uh, you believe happened, which didn't. And it's the job of a criminal investigator, when a complainant comes in to file a complaint, not to believe the witness, not to believe the complainant, not to say they're lying, but just to recognize that people make mistakes. They may assume something to be true, which is not. And it's the job of the criminal investigator to be skeptical and to ask those questions to make sure that you are gauging how it is a person uh, represents events that have happened to them. You need to look for, for weird changes in the way they represent you know, verb tenses, uh, switching from active voice to passive voice. Uh, these are all little linguistic indicators you should pay attention to. In, a previous, in some previous videos, I think twice I've discussed, uh, maybe once, could be twice, I've discussed um, a traffic stop that I was on, and in it, I was, this guy stabbed me. Um, he had a, it was like a little camping tool inside his wallet. I'd already patted him down for weapons, and I found none, so, uh, you know, I'm slightly more comfortable with this guy, but I'm, you know, I remember my street, street survival tactics training. Uh, I'm giving myself that space just in case, because even if they don't have a weapon, 
uh, they can still reach for yours, they can you know, punch you, whatever. So I always keep that kind of that space when I'm uh, talking to a guy or a gal on a traffic stop, so it gives me a little bit of reaction time and distance. <clears throat> anyway, he's fiddling around for his um, uh, license and you know, the other information that I wanted. We are behind the car. Uh, I've watched you know, the, one of the good things slash bad things about dash cams uh, and videographic equipment in law enforcement is that instead of having to guess and reconstruct uh, how police officers die, we actually get to watch it and study how they die. And you go, oh, well, I don't want to do that because I see how that puts you at a very bad tactical disadvantage and uh, it can be fatal. Uh, I refer you to the shooting death of Mark Coates, uh, who for some reason decides to pat people down standing in front of them. Uh, that decision cost him his life. Um, Daryl Lunsford, um, he, he let uh, not only the, the driver out of the car, but he tolerated two of the passengers getting out of the car and coming to the rear uh, with only a mild warning about, you know, you guys need to stay over there. And, and he, it cost him his life. Uh, from the time that they attacked him until they had his firearm and they shot him in the back of the head, is, it's not even ten seconds. I mean, it is quick. I mean, he's on the ground in about three and then they drag him off, take out his weapon, shoot him uh, in the back of the neck. And this is not a, a, a video about, oh, why do the police behave in particular ways? But a large part of the, the tactics that you see police officers using are in response to studying the, the deaths of other people, which we now get to watch on camera and study exhaustively. Also, we read reports of our law enforcement officers who are killed. Um, some of them are just gut-wrenching, like an officer who, as he was essentially being decapitated, uh, his last his last act was to shoot through his own body to kill the guy who was cutting his throat. I mean, it's really hard shit. Uh, he shot through his arm and his flank to, to try to get the guy. Just really, really difficult shit uh, to go through. <clears throat> but you've got to study it. Uh, your life depends on it. And you've got to develop tactics that are uh, that address things that happen in the world. So like the shooting, uh, the Kehoe brother shooting, uh, some sovereign citizens who uh, have shot officers. You need to pay attention to your, how you uh, stand with respect to a person you pulled out of a car and other occupants in the car. You want to keep that person between you and the other occupants. So if they, you know, pull, so that way one, you'll notice if they're doing the Kehoe thing of putting on a bulletproof vest, that's a clue that something bad might be about to happen. Uh, just FYI, if you're a cop and you see a guy on a traffic stop strapping on like a, a bulletproof vest, you might want to be concerned. Um, you know, you don't want to let the guy who's out of the car distract you from what the passenger's doing, like retrieving a firearm, like the Sovereign Citizen case I've talked about before. Uh, he gets out with his, I think it was an AK-47, and the, the guy who's in the back creates the distraction and the two officers react to it, diverting their attention away. They were in a bad position to start off with, uh, tactically, uh, but diverting their attention, and while they've got their back turned, he comes out, <laughs> kills them. Uh, one of them was the police chief's son. That agency needed uh, to really do some training. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so I, I've got that, all that in mind. I've got my uh, radio in hand, and anyway, he's re he's fiddling around to get his license, and I'm looking back right between him and the guy in the car, and then I catch the the glint and the light, and I realize that you know, well, oh, I'm fucked. Uh, I don't mean anything sexual there, but I mean like I'm about to have a very extremely bad day, which I did. Uh, he stabbed me in my hand, uh, I got cut a couple of other times, uh, and when I told that story, I said, and, uh, you know, I only went through the, you know, he cut me with a knife, which is true, I didn't go through the whole rigmarole, and there I'm talking in the active voice, he did X, I did Y, and then my story shifts to the passive voice, it's not by happenstance, there's a reason, there's an emotional co connection that I have with that event. Um, it is a very traumatic event that happened to me. It doesn't disturb me, but it was nevertheless traumatic when it happened, both emotionally and physically. <clears throat> um, I remember, it's, the reason I bring this up is because it's the only traumatic thing I've had happen where I don't have a clear recollection of all of the, the salient details and even a great deal of the peripheral details. And the reason that I don't is because if, you know, I don't know if you can see it now, but uh, in the back of my head you'll notice there are some places where hair doesn't grow. I'm not going bald. The, that scar tissue, that cowlick that I have is not a factory option. Uh, that's an aftermarket add-on and it came from this incident. That's from where the gravel uh, hit me, well, where my head hit the gravel and, I, you know, I was in it. Uh, I you know, got whacked in the head really, really hard. And up until that point where I got hit in the head, I have very clear memories of what happened. And afterwards, I have virtually no clear memories. The only clear memory I have after that 
is of uh, vomiting and the ex extreme pain that came with you know the, the pressure from the vomiting. Why I vomited, I can't say. Could it because you know, shot, the shooting, the stabbing, I don't know. Uh, or the blow to my head. And the reason I can't remember, it has two independently sufficient reasons. Uh, it could be the blow to the head that's the cause. Or it could be the medications that they gave me, uh, the paramedics and the, the doctors gave me. Uh, you know, for pain and, you know, whatever, what all the, whatever they did. You know, all the voodoo stuff they do. Uh, but I don't have any <coughs> clear memory of that. And so I don't speak about it actively. Because it is a passive event. I know from the report what had to have happened, the, the uh, only plausible explanation of what happened. Uh, but anyway, the way I tell the sto told the story is uh, that, you know, he cut me, and uh, shortly thereafter, he uh, contracted an acute case of lead poisoning, my way of saying he got shot, uh, which is true, he, he did get shot. Uh, what I don't say is, I shot him. And the reason I don't say I shot him is because I don't remember it. I can represent what an independent, you know, what the investigation tells you, but I have no independent recollection. And so when I talk about that, I like to, I do it that way, so that way I don't mislead people into thinking that I have a, that I'm representing a stronger case than I actually have. <clears throat> I'm very uh, keen on not overstating uh, things. I, if I'm going to be uh, hyperbolic or exaggerate, I make it obvious. <clears throat> but anyway, that's why. It's just that I have no recollection of it, uh, and therefore I don't talk about it as though it's a memory that I have. And I don't talk about, uh, the anyway, whatever. I, I just make sure I do that uh, because of my emotional state, my intuition in relation to it, and the memories that I don't have, which I otherwise would. So there's that. But for all other traumatic incidents in which I've been involved, um, even ones where I had been on medication following surgery, uh, I have a very, very, very good memory. So anyway... <clears throat> Uh, I, too, have been a victim of false reports by a person who was honestly wrong, not lying, not, not sexual related. Uh, here it was a police officer. And the way this came about was, uh, I, I was I had been working a case, and then someone else was working a different case, and on my way to the hospital for my victim, uh, I gave him a roll-by for his case. Uh, so he was okay, see so if he needed any help for me to do anything since I'm going to the hospital anyway. And he had a driver who was severely injured, who was going to be transported to the hospital. And I said, well, I'll wait until she's transported, I'll go, with them. I'll follow them, and then when I get there, I'll, you know, do whatever. <clears throat> so, uh, when I cleared the scene, um, the radio traffic was something along the lines of, my call sign is going to the hospital, this victim is going to the hospital, one of our internal affairs assholes heard this transmission, from which he assumed that it meant that I'm driving the victim to the hospital, which is a violation of our agency guidelines, to be sure. Uh, it's not your job to be a medic. Um, you, that's what the medics are there for. You let them do their job. So he writes out a sworn statement in absolute good faith. I mean, he, think, he believes he's telling the truth. He'd made no effort to distinguish between a fact and an assumption, and he represented his assumptions as facts, and that began an internal affairs investigation for violations of standard operating procedure. So that was very unfun. Now it didn't take long uh, for that to be you know, run down and show that he didn't know what he was talking about, and he got disciplined for it, for failing to make the distinctions that I had mentioned, uh, because he should have done that. He's a trained criminal investigator. We expect people who work in the internal affairs asshole division to be right at the top of their game and to not make these very basic elementary uh, mistakes. So we went and got sworn statements from all the paramedics, uh, the officer who was on the scene I was assisting, and anyway, it, it lasted about two days. Two very unfun days, I have to add. Um, like I said, he got disciplined for it. Christine Blasey Ford is not going to be disciplined for any of this. I mean, she doesn't work for anybody who can discipline her. She's definitely not going to be prosecuted because they don't prosecute people who falsely accuse people of sexual assault because they don't want to discourage future sexual assault victims. When I say they don't, they do sometimes. It's very, very rare. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, this prosecutor was teasing those details out. You said that uh, there was a conversation that happened downstairs. How do you know that this happened? Oh, I don't know that it happened. I assumed that it happened. Well, her statement doesn't say that. Her statement says that it did happen. She's, represent she's claiming to be a fact witness to an event she did not see to an event she did not hear, to an event that she has assumed must have been happening somewhere, and therefore 
she knows for, for certainty that it did in fact happen. Uh, she doesn't know who shoved her into the room, uh, allegedly. Uh, the only thing that she's 100% uh, certain about, where she'll say I'm 100% certain, is that it was definitely Brett Kavanaugh on top of her who was doing the bad thing. This not was my poor dog who's old and sick and sorry, very sad. <clears throat> anyway, uh, assumptions, facts. She will represent things that she has on no evidence whatever assumed to be in fact the case. Uh, she represents those as in fact being the case, and it just. It's very good that this prosecutor was teasing it out. It's a very bad format because the prosecutor does not, the, the investigator in this case, did not get an opportunity to question the person you know, for any length of time because they're doing this five minutes this side, five minutes that side. And so it's like just when you've laid a foundation for making sure the person remembers what it is they've said, has had an opportunity to correct what it is that they've said, which Ford did in some, some instances, uh, nevertheless, these problems remain. Now, these don't mean that she's a bad person. It doesn't mean she's lying. She can legitimately believe things that aren't true. A lot of people do. Uh, false memories are a thing. Misremembering is very common. In trauma events, it's very common for you to have memory distortions. Uh, some people get uh, hyper, like, very seared into their mind, hyper-detailed memories that are accurate. And other people get, you know, hyper-memory of things that didn't happen and everything in between. It's the job of the investigator to, to very uh, painstakingly and thoroughly and meticulously go through everything that a complainant or a witness is saying. Now, I've discussed in the past what it's like when I interrogate someone, which we like to call interview because it sounds nicer. Would you like to come in for an interrogation? Actually, now that you ask, uh, thank you, no. Uh, you know, would you like to come in for an interview or a conversation? You know, something that's it's a friendlier sounding language, even though it really isn't. I never sit someone down for an interrogation, other than an initial interview that, like you might get on the scene. I'm talking about when, when I'm ready to, to actually put the person in there and I'm on, you know, on the cusp of making an arrest. And this is like the last thing that I'm going to do before I finish this case. It does give the opportunity uh, to the person to tell his side of the story in, in very painstaking detail. Uh, if you are hauled in for one of these, don't participate. You're not going to talk yourself out of an arrest. Uh, I would be very surprised if there exists a single criminal defense attorney anywhere, maybe there does exist one, but I highly doubt it, uh, could be true, don't think it is, uh, who, will, who will tell you, my word, it was so great that my client spoke to the police. I'm glad he or she did that. You will not find that criminal defense attorney. Or if you do find that criminal defense attorney, get a different one because <laughs> he's going to help walk you right into, the, uh, into prison, I can assure you. He's not, he's not a good one. So anyway, uh, I don't actually much care what it is the person has to say uh, as far as like uh, their, their version of events. Uh, and the reason for it is, in most cases, I'm an evidence kind of investigator. Before I sit a person down, I already know the timeline, I know the evidence, I've committed it to memory, uh, I know the witness statements, I know what the forensics is, I have, I have uh, uh, the, uh, the various writings of this. I have committed to memory, so I know everything that has happened, or I have a pretty good idea of what has happened, and I'm giving you the opportunity, really, to shoot yourself in the foot by destroying your credibility, so that way I can turn that over to the prosecutor, who can then use it in court to point out that you've made false exculpatory statements, which is, uh, other than having something recorded on video, and like high definition, uh, perfect audio, and the person narrating what they're doing as they're doing it, like, you know, they're recording themselves doing a crime. Other than something like that, a false exculpatory statement is the best thing that you have against a defendant because they've already proved that they're willing to lie to further their own interests. They were willing to distort facts or you know, something along those lines in order to make the policeman go away. You know, please, I don't want to be, I don't want any consequences, whatever it happens to be. So that's really what you're looking for. Now, What's really useful, and it's like the best evidence that, uh, well, I can't say the best because, really, I mean, you could get caught on tape being somewhere else at the time you're alleged to be somewhere doing a crime. Useful. Uh, I know of a rape case where a woman accused someone of rape who could not possibly have done it because at the time the rape was happening, he was broadcasting live on television, which is why she remembers him being the rapist. He was on the TV. And she goes, oh, that's my rapist. So she somehow transposed the TV guy, the TV personality who does, I don't know, whatever he did, 
uh, who's always on the, you know, the local station, somehow she transposed that in her mind onto the man who had uh, raped her and blamed the entirely wrong guy. I mean, you get this kind of stuff that happens. It's not uncommon. You know, you know, don't, don't just believe uh, victims. Um, look for the evidence. Follow the leads down. Take credible claims seriously, but you need to make sure in the initial interview that you're determining whether or not it is a credible claim. And Ford's claim is, on any standard of evidence known to the law, whether it be criminal, civil, whatever it is, is not credible in any uh, degree. The only way it's credible is if you feel like she really believes it, um, which is, I don't, but you know, assuming that you do, I can see where you could come from there. But when you look at the, uh, you know, what she has said against what you can show, they're just you know, miles apart. The, the, her claims have nothing whatever to do with anything that you can verify. Everyone she has named as a fact witness uh, either says, I have no recollection of it, or positively refutes her, like her friend uh, Kaiser, who her lawyer put out the other day. She's not refuting Dr. Ford, as has been claimed. She believes Dr. Ford. This is, this is what indoctrination into feminist dogma looks like. She has, in fact, refuted the claim. I realize that she may want to say, I'm not refuting the claim, but she has explicitly, she has overtly contradicted a claim made by Dr. Ford. That is, to the extent that it's true, a refutation. You can try to spin it however you want. I still believe her. It just shows that you, you're capable of cognitive dissonance. Without the dissonance, you're capable of believing two simultaneously incompatible, incompatible things without any emotional problems, whatever. You believe, to, on, on facts known to her, that she does not know uh, the man who is accused of this crime despite the fact that Dr. Ford has said that she does know this man. And she says, well, no, that's actually not true. Nevertheless, I believe her. Well, all right. Good luck. Uh, Ford, on, one of the great pieces of evidence for any witness who, uh, or uh, for evidence of, of things that have happened at the time, is contemporaneously taken notes, uh, contemporaneously generated evidence of some kind, uh, you know, it could be just something someone said to someone, something of that nature. But the, the, the gold standard there is like something memorialized in writing, notes, diaries, journals, whatever. Uh, you know, it's interesting. And Brett Kavanaugh has a very detailed uh, ledger of his life. And there is no event documented there that uh, indicates any gathering of the type involving the people uh, with the number of people uh, that Ford has said were there, anywhere in there. And the thing about his, his uh, calendars is they're not just recollections of what had happened where, you know, you could, um, if after something's happened, you could write about it to like, oh, in the future this might be useful if I lie in here. These are things that he generated both before, so they were prospective, uh, like you know, a calendar is, I'm going to do this on that date, I'm going to do this on the other date, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then they're also, they have a diary component. I did do this, or I failed to do that, uh, which I had planned to be doing. And he, you know, he writes things there that are actually incriminating, like that he went out for beers. This is another part of, about the the leftist smear campaign that he lied about his having uh, about the age of uh, you know, how old he had to be to drink in Maryland at the time. Not only did he not lie, he act, he in addition to not lying was actually accurate. His claim was true. He said for the majority of the time that he was in high school, the drinking age was 18. True. Uh, it was legal for the seniors to drink during that year? True. He did not say, and I was a senior. It, he wasn't legal, but the, the claims that he made were that the alcohol was legally purchased, which for all I know is true, uh, by the seniors for whom it was legal to purchase it, which is definitely true that it was legal for them to purchase it. Uh, whether or not it was legal for them to furnish it to a 17-year-old is a different question, and he did not claim that that happened. He did not claim that he was 18 at the time. In fact, he explicitly claimed that he was 17 uh, at the time, that he was drinking these beers, that he liked these beers, and sometimes he had too many beers. So he is incriminating himself in, the, in underage drinking. I mean, he didn't go out of his way to say, oh, and by the way, I was definitely not under the age, but, you know, if you... If you follow the, the, the statements that he said, it's very clear. He is, he is admitted to drinking underage. And by implication, someone has furnished alcohol to him when he was a minor. So, uh, interesting. But these aren't the kinds of things that are disqualifying for a judge or anybody else. Oh, in high school you drank beer. 
illegally. Oh my God, that never happens. We first case we've ever seen. And, you know, no, it's it's common. Uh, all the, uh, and that an agency is looking for on like a background interview on those types of questions is did you tell the truth? I mean, if you admit to having committed some kind of crime like that, you know, some drinking underage thing, very common. They say, oh, thank you for being honest. We don't care. But if you lie about it and they got contradictory information that says, oh, actually, I did. I do know this person to have been drinking beer underage. You're done. Because then you have not only a bad judgment as a high school student, as a teenager, you have bad judgment right now, today, and that you are willing to lie in order to further your own uh, financial interests. Or career interests or something or, or some such. So that's disqualifying right there, telling a lie in the interview process anywhere. But petty crimes that look, if, if that's the litmus test, then you're not going to have cops, you're not going to have politicians, you're not going to have people who work anywhere. Uh, there are very few perfect people walking around, and in fact, so few of them exist that I've never met one. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that what is actually true is that there exists no perfect people, uh, no person who has, ever, who has managed to go through his entire life without having run afoul of some uh, trivial crime, uh, some uh, trivial statute here or there. Now, other traumatic uh, things that I've gone through where um, <clears throat> after I'd had surgery, yeah, I'll do that, this one. Anyway, after I'd had surgery, um, and I was probably going to be having more surgeries, uh, they weren't certain. While I was recovering from the surgery, I was getting in the shower and you know I had a reconstruction done. I slipped, fell, and instead of just taking the fall on like, like a, I don't know, a stunt person, I just out of, I stepped down to try to catch myself, tore something in, in there that, that they worked on. They didn't know how bad it was going to be until it had, you know, improperly healed uh, to such an extent they could look. Anyway, it was anticipated I was going to be out for a much longer time than the original uh, recovery time they thought that I would be having. And so uh, what had happened was I had decided to. Um, you know, I wanted to still be useful, so I did dispatching for uh, quite a while. And when I'd come out of, I th it was like the fifth week uh, of recovery, I you know, I was, had one of those little uh, boots they put you in to protect the thing, which I'd taken off to get, to get the shower. Anyway, so I'm hobbling around on my crutches. Uh, you know, I'm a crippled bastard walking around. I'm up on the desk. I'm studying things. And one day, I decided to do a lunch run. So I go to whatever it was. I think it was Burger It actually was Burger King. I remember very distinctly that it was Burger King that I was going to be going to, but on my way there, a uh, call came over the radio that there had been a car crash at an intersection right near it. So I said, oh, I'm, I'm really close. I will go do a, you know, a looky-loo and see what is going on. So I pull up that Kojak light <laughs> and whoop, 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 I go over there and uh, you know, there'd been a wreck and then there was another wreck uh, further down. And so I'm like, oh, it's a big goat fuck. <clears throat> so I'm going around to check to see if everybody's injured. Uh, the driver of the, the first incident, uh, one of the drivers in there said his back hurt a little bit, but he was otherwise fine. His passenger was like, I'm fine. I'm like, do you want an ambulance? I said, no. I, okay. So I you know, hobbled my crippled ass back to my car and because I'm not walking that far uh, to where the other one was. Throw that bitch in reverse and zip on back down the road to check on the other one. And at that point, uh, the woman who was driving that decided to develop a little bit of uh, what we call Pemco pain. Once people come and say, officer, officer, I saw it all. This person didn't do anything wrong. Oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not at fault. Oh, my neck, my back, help. Oh, you know, so she's, she's doing that. And I'm like, look, lady, uh, there's not even any damage on your car. Was, you know, whatever. By the time I get back up to the first wreck, uh, it was a 17 year old boy who was the driver. And uh, he did not know, and obviously I did not know, but I still feel tremendously guilty over this. It has fucked me up for years, emotionally, even though intellectually I know. It's not my fault. I didn't cause this incident. Uh, there's nothing I could have done that would have changed the outcome of this incident. He was going to be dead either way because he had uh, a defect in his aorta and it ruptured. And the, I knew right away what had happened because the way he described the pain is he collapsed and this the knife through the back kind of thing that's very common with when the aorta is dissecting. And, uh, you know, he's a 17 year old kid, just, you know, just dying right there. And there's nothing to be done about it. So the only thing I did was sit there and just, you know, lie to him, tell him that 
you're just going into shock. Don't be afraid. You're going to wake up from this. You're going to feel a little dizzy. You know, as he's blood, as he's exsanguinating inside, and he died. And the last thing he said was, you know, tell my mom I'm sorry. It's stupid shit. So, you know, that's what I told her when I delivered the death notice. But, uh, at the same time that was happening, not the exact same moment, but it, I was on painkillers at the time because, you know, recovering from surgery and everything. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. I got called into our internal affairs people. This is about a year after the other incident I was telling you about. Um, and I didn't know why, but I was scared that maybe, the, you know, they're worried that I was on painkillers and I was driving and this kid died. I don't know. I wasn't involved in the crash or anything. I was armed. Uh, you know, I'd been on it for long enough. I wasn't, like, impaired or anything. I talked to my doctor about it and, you know, taking low doses uh, to help get me through the day because I was doing rehab, you know, physical therapy. On Anyway, whatever. So I'm worried about this, the fact that there is a dead boy. I'm just scared shitless going up because I show up to work and they tell me they need to see you and, you know, the, our version of internal affairs, uh, they don't want you to be armed, which is, you know, it's not a good sign. I didn't, you know, surrender my gun. I went up there anyway with it. I'm like, I don't care what they want. Um, and so I go up there and we had the, this guy who was, this wasn't the one from the year before. Uh, he, you know, I made it clear, just, you just stay the fuck away from me. Even though he was being completely sincere in his absolutely outrageous allegation against me that had no factual support or whatever. It was based purely on his partially listening to a radio conversation and making assumptions. Uh, you, you just stay the fuck away from me, buddy. Uh, I got nothing to say to you. Don't. If I'm getting, you know, like, murdered on the side of the road, don't come help me. Just stay the fuck away. Anyway, so the the guy who's in charge of that section is going to conduct the interview himself. His name was Harvey. I say that only because he had this really weird way of talking. He was a native a speaker of American English, but he was just, I don't quite know where he grew up. But we called it Harvey Bonnox, because it, anyway, it was just crazy. So I sit down, he has me write a statement. Uh, I find out that, that this is about uh, someone who had been accessing pornography on one of the computers at the desk. And I was like, oh, I didn't want anything about that. So I, I write out, you know, and you know, my heart's in my throat, because I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking it's about this dead kid thing, and it's not. Uh, so, you know, I'm like, I'll write this out, my handwriting's worse than normal because, you know, nervous. And I was like, I'm sorry to report I have no knowledge of any egregious trespasses of, you know, the agency policy on the use of computers and the uh, accessing of pornography therefrom. Uh, and so I, you know, hand this over and he's reviewing it and, and then he decides, he, he's doing a little bit of a I'll, good cop, bad cop all by himself. And he's like, I'm not talking about no trespassing. I'm talking about... And I was like, uh, so I was like, I noticed you got a dictionary on your, your you know, shelf over there. You might want to look it up and see what trespass actually means. Uh, anyway, so I also noticed he's not armed, which is why he didn't want me to be armed, because he, he was not. I don't know why. But I, I noticed that his holster was empty. He didn't notice that uh, I had mine under my outfit. So anyway, um... While he's doing this, uh, in this hostile interview, this interrogation, he's also trying to pretend like he's teaching me as we go. You know, there's no reason you can't learn while you're here, I guess. Uh, anyway, whatever. Uh, and I was like, oh, you know, I, so I, I flipped the script. And I'm like, well, I'll just reverse interview you. What do you mean? Learn? I mean, what, what can I possibly learn from you? So I'm trying to get him frustrated for going through this. <laughs> And he's like, well, you know, when you reached over and grabbed that cup of coffee after I asked that one question, there was that pause while you drank it. That could be the opportunity for you to tell a, tell a lie. It's like, true as you tell it. It could also be that I paid $6 for my triple venti hazelnut butter caramel mocha and I'd like to finish it before it gets cold. You just never know these days who's doing what. Uh, I have a very clear recollection of this conversation, even though I was on drugs at the time. Um, anyway, at the end... Uh, uh, he attributed something to me from the statement. I was like, I didn't write that in the statement. You need, you need to read it again. And it's right in front of me. And I flipped around and said, yeah, that's right. And then he snatched. He's like, you're not destroying that statement. I'm like, I don't want to destroy the statement. You know, he's, just, he's trying to put me off my guard, off my game. I'm like, whatever. Uh, like, look, go make photocopies of them. Give me one of those. I, I don't want to destroy my statement or change it or anything. I, I've said what I have to say. I'm sticking by it. It's true. Whatever. And so towards the end of, end of the interview, I asked him, I said, by the way, what 
kind of pornography are we talking about here? It was lesbian porn. And so I just start cracking up laughing. I'm like, you're a good investigator. I can tell you really keep your ear to the ground. Like I'm going to be looking at lesbian porn. I mean, <laughs> I'm like, I don't come to work to vomit, sir. And, uh, and so after he'd give me some, you know, trying to teach me kind of helpful tips to teach me. So as I develop in my career, I can become a better investigator through, you know, the mentorship of this brilliant mind. And I said, by the way, I have a little tip for you. Make sure that when you do an interview that you're actually the one who's armed and not the person you're interrogating. And I'm, you know, I'm pulling up my shirt to show him. I'm like, have a good day. So anyway, that was the end of that. Uh, he was just pathetic. And the, it, the reason I talk about that is just you've got to pay attention to these things. And I'm just talking, uh, I'm bringing this up to point out that while this is going on, and it is a very significant emotional event in my life, these two things. One, I think I'm being hauled in because this boy has died, and I don't know, there's perhaps a lawsuit for negligence. Uh, in fact, I was on, you know, uh, Vicodin at the time. Uh, yeah, I was on Vicodin at the time. It, who knows? So I thought maybe I'm going to get relieved of duty. Uh, I'm going to get suspended. I'm, gonna, I'm in a world of hurt, and it turns out that some asshole's looking at lesbian porn on duty, and for some reason they decided to interview me just, just in case I, that one particular day, decided to look at some chicks naked doing sexual things. Um, all of the, the traumatic, emotionally significant events that I've had, I remember with extreme clarity. I remember the, uh, the, uh, the day, I remember who was there, uh, you know, the, that boy who died, I remember his name, I know his license plate number, I know his driver's license number, I remember all of the witnesses, I remember it with perfect, well, as perfect clarity as you can get, precisely because it was very emotional and very difficult. It was very important for me to make sure that I was committing these things to memory. Um, Ford, on the other hand, she can barely tell you what year this happened. She, uh, she either got to this house by herself or arranged for a way to get to this house uh, and vice versa, you know, leaving it. She either left on her own and got herself home somehow or she made the arrangements for this. She has no idea how she got there. She has no idea <clears throat> uh, how she left home. Uh, I'm sorry, how she left this house and got home. She is not certain how many people were there. She was in her statement, but then when actually being questioned, well, there may be some other people there I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, um, so, you know, that changes. She she doesn't know uh, various facts. She assumes things, and then she represents those as being facts that are known to her when they aren't. She names a whole bunch of people who are asserted to have seen this or to be aware of this fact or that fact or the other fact. And when talked to, they're unaware of these facts. And uh, for some degree, you know, maybe they did all forget. Who knows? I can't say I wasn't there. Uh, it could be anything. But one of the things that is uh, that weighs on my mind is that this is a politically sensitive thing, and the reason that she's coming forward is because of this appointment. Now I've heard that that's not why she's coming forward. That that her allegations were made before the you know when he came out on the short list. That's uh, not quite true. The uh, Kavanaugh came out on the 10th. She uh, did the anonymous reporting thing on the 20th. That's the first verified uh, report from her that I can substantiate. The other ones are, well, I told this person, but I didn't name names. Okay, so you didn't tell this person, is what you're saying. If you did not name the name, you did not tell this person. And her husband says, oh, no, she definitely said it. Uh, the therapy, uh, uh, I'm sorry, wh whatever it was. Well, we go look at the notes, which they don't want to disclose. It is not mentioned in the therapist's notes where she made this report where she says she did not mention the name, uh, but the husband assures us that he, she told him. Uh, um, the errors, the inconsistencies between her claims and the, what is contained in the notes of her therapist, the contemporaneous notes taken by the therapist from that session, are of course not Dr. Ford's fault. They are the therapist's fault. The therapist was confused, or I guess incompetent at taking notes. Could be true. Don't know. Wasn't there. Never met any of these people. Uh, but it just all, it seems like every error that is made, uh, is, oh, well, that was an assumption. I just thought it was true. Or, oh, if it, to the extent that there's something that's inconsistent with it, that's someone else's fault. Why doesn't her friend remember being at this party? Why does her friend not know Brett? Why does her friend say she does not know Brett Kavanaugh? Her explanation was, well, my friend has health issues, and I'm glad she's taking care of herself. Did you get hit in the head? 
I mean, what kind of health issues does she have? Maybe she did, I don't know. Uh, it wasn't gone into. But Dr. Ford is glad that her, the friend who is refuting her claims, and uh, certainly not substantiating them, uh, is glad that that friend, who's basically just, you know, said, sorry, I'm not in, don't know what you're talking about, is taking care of herself. She's very concerned that her friend uh, be in good health while, you know, cutting the legs off from under her claims. But anyway, one of the things that's, that happens is uh, feminists, you know, the fake rape group, love uh, to, to do this thing where they will locate events way in the past where they can't be checked. And they use those to say, and therefore you should just believe because there are reasons that survivors uh, behave in the way they do. First of all, they're not rape survivors, they're rape victims. Now, I understand there is a rhetorical point in, in distinguishing the mindset between a survivor mindset and a, a uh, victim mindset. That's not what the feminists are doing. They want to pretend that uh, sexual crimes are unique, they're special, and they're, you know, because women tend to get them more than men, it, you know, once you exclude prisoners and various uh, other types of, of things, but whatever. But let's just go with that. It's women who are the, the bulk of the victims of this. Could be true. Uh, that, and because it's the only crime in which it is true, if it is true, it's a special thing. It shows that there's, an, there's a special hatred for women. They're, it's, they're super special. They're targeted because of their womanliness, their, their girly bits, and therefore it's important. And if you've gone through something that is not actually intrinsically dangerous, it's not intrinsically deadly, uh, we're nevertheless going to pretend as though you are a hero for having survived it when you didn't survive it. There are about one, one, about one percent, a little less, uh, and this is static over decades. About one percent of homicides that are perpetrated have a sexual element to them. Full stop. That translates to 150 to 170 ish cases per year in the United States. This is approximately the same number, uh, you know, within a few people per year who uh, are bludgeoned to death with hands and feet in your typical kind of bar fights. It's not more dangerous than that, but we don't talk about bar fight survivors. We don't talk about home invasion survivors, because these things are not intrinsically deadly. They do, uh, you know, the assault, punching people in the head, does have a, a slightly elevated risk of killing them, but it's very trivial. It's not like uh, being shot, where if you get you know, a gunshot uh, victim, we still call them gunshot victims very often, uh, unless it's serious and then in case it, you're a you know, survivor of, of, of that horrible event. Um, to give you an, another comparison here, 150 people per year dying from that is about three times what it is who are killed in the United States in lightning strikes per year on average. Now, a lightning strike, being struck by lightning, is the quintessential example of an event whose occurrence is so freakishly rare that it's actually not rational to worry that much about it, is uh, only it, people who are killed in those incidents is a third of what it is who, who die because of sexually motivated crimes per year in the United States. And yet they're hyper-obsessed about this statistic of the 150-ish, 170 uh, people per year, not all women, by the way. Now, that's just the people who die from lightning strikes. The number of people who uh, actually are victims of lightning strikes or who are you know, hit by lightning per year is about 500 to 600 per year. It's much larger, five, six, seven hundred 700 per year, depending on the year, much larger than the number of people who die. And even though it's several times, you know, several times as many people are hit by lightning per year than who are murdered because of sexual reasons, uh, they never, the, you know, and, the lightning strike being the quintessential example of an event whose occurrence is so frequently rare that it borders on silly to invest any emotional time worrying about it. I mean, if there's a lightning storm outside, okay, yeah, I won't go there. But, you know, that's, that's sensible to worry about. In the same way to be sensible to worry about if you're told, hey, there is a rape gang in that room, you might go, well, you know, I won't go in there. I will just stay over here for now and I'll wait for the rape gang to leave. In the same way that you go indoors when it's lightning and you're you know, lightning striking, you're going, oh, you know, I'll go wait inside until it passes. You know, it's not silly when you're right on the cusp of it and you know you're on the cusp of it. But for all other things, it, it is, it's a bit silly. And the women who, the people who die from sexually motivated crimes are only a fraction of the people who are struck by lightning per year in the United States. So just bear, bear that in mind about the hysteria here and the, the way they 
use the terminology to try to pretend that the, the incidence and the impact of this is much larger than it is. Now, I'm not saying it's good, obviously. Sexual assault, like being beaten up, is, is really bad. Uh, being stabbed is really, really bad. But, you know, let's not overstate uh, what these crimes are like. Um, and one other thing that really drives me up the wall, it, it's starting to grind my gears, is how I didn't know it wasn't my fault. Shut up. I don't want to hear from you. Uh, you, you. If you're the victim of a crime, you know it's not your fault the crime happened to you. It's the criminal's fault, okay? Now, the reason I carry some, some water about that boy who died is because I was in a position to save him, or potentially save him, even though I really wasn't. But I, nevertheless, neglected to do something that, uh, that from then on I always did in every crash I went to, um, which may have saved his life. I carry guilt over that because there was a small possibility that judicious action on my part could have facilitated this boy's uh, you know, live, surviving this incident. But because I failed to do that, uh, I will never know. Uh, that opportunity was lost. But ultimately, I did not do this to him. Someone else did this to him. But nevertheless, I had an additional obligation that most people don't have to be on the lookout for these types of things uh, to the extent possible um, and to, do, you know, to, to take some kind of sensible and reasonable action. Sensible and reasonable and illegal action are different things. A legal response was to absolve the agency and myself of responsibility by asking this person, do you want medical care? If they refuse medical care, whatever happens is on them. A sensible reaction, uh, even though not legally required, would be, even though you don't want uh, to go to the hospital, I'm still calling an ambulance. Let them look you over. They will tell you what they're going to tell you and then you can make a decision. How does that sound? It doesn't cost a penny to them. It's picked up from tax dollars, or I don't know wherever it's distributed, but it's not paid for by the person on the scene unless they get in the ambulance and go and their insurance picks it up or whatever it is. I should have done that. And from that day on, I always did that. Uh, for anything more than, you know, just the most trivial of collisions, you know, I'm talking about there's no bumper damage. In this case, was, the speed was about, you know, 26, uh, 25 miles per hour. It was very low impact, but the airbag did deploy. Anyway, whatever. <clears throat> Um, like this lawyer who wrote an article on CNN the other day, Brett Kavanaugh have a, and I have a lot in common. We both kept diaries and journals or whatever it is. But for 30 years or 25 years, I've kept this inside me that I was raped and I didn't know. You know, as a lawyer who went to Harvard, I w I'll translate. I was too stupid to figure out that the victims of the crimes aren't responsible for the crime. I just, I had no idea. For the, you know, all these decades, I've been a lawyer at a high, you know, at a good law firm. I went to one of the best law schools in the country. I'm extremely intelligent. I just, I had never before heard until Dr. Ford got on TV that rape victims aren't the perpetrators. No one told me at Harvard Law. You're just a fucking retard. <clears throat> and she goes on, she's, when I was thinking about the, uh, <coughs> The Brett Kavanaugh uh, supposedly lying about the drinking age in Maryland <coughs> in 1982. She's one of the people who's saying that I believe he lied. Not only did he not lie, he was actually correct in what he said. Just you know, lots of idiots out there. Um, now on to the point about, uh, actually I'll just do this in a separate video because it's about my FBI investigation. I need my FBI. And I'll do that in a few minutes. So you guys have a great day.